Good evening, everyone. Is he there? Before his grace, his mercy, my bishop, <laughs> the lord of the hustle, <laughs> come and preach. would like to read. <laughs> Is that an honor? It's like just like you and me on the stage. There's like no one else happening. Here. <laughs> we read together from Luke chapter 19, verse 28 to 44. I'm reading from New International Version. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphag and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw the, their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it and said, If you even had only known on this day what will bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you on the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you for tonight that we can be here in this house. Thank you, Father, for the vulnerability of those who worship amongst us and that we can feel that this is a place, Lord God, in which we can and will encounter you. In the name of Christ, amen. Good evening, everyone. I also welcome to those who are visiting us for the first time and those who are watching us online, wherever it is that you may be watching uh, the service from. I've got about 15 minutes left uh, before I wrap up, and so I've just got some thoughts around, around Palm Sunday. Some people say, I can't preach in 15 minutes. Watch this space. An eventful moment that Sunday, that day, sorry, that Jesus came into Jerusalem. There are whole lots of different groups of people. I'd like to suggest that 2,000 years later, not much has changed. And the same groups of people that we found at the first entrance into Jerusalem that began the week, that holy week, those same groups of people are evident in the church today, in our communities today, and can I say, even say, in this church here tonight. First group of people, a group of people known as the Zealots. The Zealots were pretty much really quite hardcore, and they were really political in nature. They were waiting for a, a revolution to take place. Uh, they were ready, and they were prepared to fight the Romans, the oppressors at the time. And quite frankly, the understanding of the scriptures uh, were in, in fact, they were so serious about the scriptures and the Old Testament and the, and the prophecies of the Messiah that was coming to, because they were sick and tired of being ruled by the Romans. They, in fact, refused to speak Greek or, or, uh, or Hebrew at all. They uh, refused completely. They were so nationalist in terms of their faith uh, that they were prepared to die for Judaism. And they were prepared to kill and when they, when they saw Jesus coming in the way he spoke and about the tearing down of the temple and he spoke about all these things and how he, was, he seemed to be anti-government and anti-establishment, they thought, hey, this is the perfect person. He was the long-awaited political leader of the time. And as Jesus came into Jerusalem, they thought, well, this is it. This is our long-awaited political leader that is going to overthrow 
the Romans. There's some of us here tonight who are like the zealots. We like to position God in the way we want to see God. And we we refuse to see God for who he really is. And so what we sometimes do is that we manipulate God into being a God who serves us. So depending on our need at the time, we will form and fashion God into someone that we think will serve our purpose at the time. And sometimes in our, in our desperation, and sometimes in our, our defiance even, we end up forming an idol of God, formed in an image that we want him to be for our own sake and for our own purposes. And so we will sometimes manipulate God then. So can I give you an example? And, and this is a broad example. Uh, in, the, in the age of something that was called the Ku Klux Klan, or white supremacy, they saw God as a God who was the God who would fight for the rights of white people, conservative white people, and would be the forefront of, of discrimination. And so they formed and shaped God. You've seen people who have uh, taken God on as a cult and have uh, abused people or have uh, manipulated people because they've formed God into their own purpose or they've manipulated God. I know sometimes even in my own journey, sometimes when it's too painful to hear what it is that God is really saying to me about something, I then begin to imagine a God in the image that I want God to be so that he can defend me and justify some of the things I end up doing then. I'm wondering if your image of God or your understanding of God, what is that, what has formed that? What has formed your understanding of who God is? Don't allow your own position or context to deform the image of who God really is. The second group of people uh, that were around that day were the Jewish religious leaders. Now they knew the Torah or the Bible, as we all know it, they knew it back to front. And the religious leaders could pretty much tell you exactly what you could do and what you couldn't do. Essentially, the religious leaders were very judgmental. Now, I don't know what your experience of church is, but I found often that people who stray away from church have often been in a position where they have felt extremely judged by religious leaders. And sometimes even we ourselves in the church can become so incredibly religious in the way we lead the church. And so we find that people amongst us and who come and worship in the church end up being judged for not following the exact letter of the law. And what happens is this, is that when we are ruled by religious leaders, somehow the spirit of God and the true essence and freedom of God, the true freedom of God, ends up being suffocated by rules and regulations. I'm amazed at how many people, and even people who would be worshipping here tonight, in a church that I think is a church of extreme grace, can live, can even be here and live under condemnation, even in their own lives. Can feel judged for things they've done or judged for things they've said. But the religious leaders at the time of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, do you notice how the very first thing they did is they wanted to try and suffocate the followers of Christ? In that they said that they were making a loud noise. And I love the scripture when the scripture speaks about when Jesus, when they said uh, the religious leaders tell the people to stop making a noise and stop praising God. And Jesus turns around and says, if they keep quiet, then even the stones will worship me. I hope and pray that when you worship here, that you never ever feel quenched in a sense that you never feel free to be who you are in Christ. 
I hope that if you worship here that you never feel that you ever have to conform to anyone else except who it is that God created you to be. Because let me tell you something, friends. In our worship and in our part of us being part of the life of a church, God wants you to be you because he created you and he created you in his image. And there should always be freedom to worship God and to express your worship and to express your calling and to express your ministry without feeling that someone is putting you in a box or else it feels like someone is busy strangling you so much so that you cannot express how you truly feel. You see, when it comes to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious, what they really hated the most was that Jesus was becoming more popular than them. You see, they are the ones that wanted to set the bar when it comes to worship. In their mind, in their mind, faith was a competition. And so when they saw the people uh, honoring Christ more than they were honoring them as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the competition became too much for them. And so they devised plans to kill Christ. I'm wondering in your life right now, what is the thing that is stifling you from becoming the Christ follower you have a sense you should be? What is the thing that is stopping you from becoming the Christ follower? Now for some, it might be your friends or the people that you hang around with. Maybe they are the ones that are becoming the stumbling block. And at some stage, and I'm the last one that says, I think we should hang around in holy huddles, but at some stage we need to move on from some of our friends. For some of us, it might be colleagues. For some of us, it might be the work that you're doing. For some of us here, it might be a boyfriend or a girlfriend that is just holding you back. For some of you here tonight, it might be sin. You know, sometimes people come to me and they say to me, Gary, I'm just, I feel so far away from God. I feel, I feel sometimes, I, I don't know if you've ever had this, when, you, when you're praying and it feels like your prayers are hitting the ceiling. Have you ever had that before? Please, can I not be the only one that's ever experienced this? Do you, you know what I'm talking about? It just feels like, I, often, my, my, often my first response is, tell me, is there a specific sin in your life that you engage with at the moment that you are not dealing with? See, it's very difficult to be caught up in, in this habitual sin of doing something consciously against God and still at the same time understand your, your real freedom to, to be the, the Christian that God wants you to be. And so sometimes it means we need to let go of some sin. Of sin, not some, all of it. Sometimes it's friends. Sometimes, what is the thing that is inhibiting you becoming the person that Christ wants you to be? Another lot of group of people were the Roman authorities, the Roman rulers. When I thought about this, um, you know, at first the Romans didn't pay much attention to, to Jesus. They'd heard about everything that he was doing, but they weren't too stressed about it. They thought it was a Jewish problem. And they, saw, they, they literally saw him as a religious fanatic. And he wasn't worrying them at all. But after then, the religious leaders started freaking out and coming to them they knew that there would be a problem, and they were forced to take a second look at Jesus. And they noticed that his popularity increased and increased and increased and increased. They then made ties between him and some of the, the zealots, and they thought, hold on a sec, trouble is brewing. It's amazing how we can get confused around this leadership thing. So one of the big things that's hit me over this Lenten period as I've thought about Easter is the thing around leadership. Now what is, the, what is the one thing that the churches and Christians often speak about? What type of leader should a Christian leader be, taking the example of Christ? Anyone? Someone said it here? A servant leader. Am I right? So we keep on saying, you know, people who lead in the church should be servant leaders. So I've really been challenged about that. I'm going, why do we have to be servant leaders? Why can't we just be servants? 
So you see what happens with us in the, in the church. We, we come up with all this religious um, gobbledygook, you know, and it sounds so religious and it sounds so inspiring and it sounds so spiritual, servant leadership. I mean, what is wrong with us? So we have to throw in the word leadership into the mix so that we can actually still make a call on something. You see, I actually, in the meantime, I've come up with a huge issue with being called a servant leader. You see, lead, a servanthood that Jesus calls us to is a complete giving of self. When I say I'm a servant leader, it means I'll serve, but I still want to lead sometimes. It means I'll serve, but I still want to call the shots every now and again. It means I'll serve, but I still want to have someone serving me. You know what a leader does? I'll serve, but I still want someone following me. And so I think we've been fooled, friends, around servant leadership. Why must there always be something tacked onto it? Why can't we just be servants? Jesus never, ever said, never, ever, ever said, you must be a servant leader like me. Did he? I'm dying to find that scripture. He didn't. He said, if you want to be first, you must be last. He said, if you want your life, you must lose your life. You want to be great, you must be the least. Nothing around servant leadership. It's just around service. And so what we do in our, in our misunderstanding of this thing is that we're going, I will serve, but on my terms. And I think that God is calling for new types of leaders that are simply just servants. Lastly, the last group of people, because I'm under pressure now to finish in 15 minutes. No, I'm not under pressure. This is the last thing I want to say. The last group of people. There's a small group of people who not only recognized that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, but they were willing to lose everything to follow him. Okay, so they reckon for the Passover that weekend, there were probably around 2 million Jewish people in Jerusalem. All right? Of those that did this, the final glory hallelujah to Jesus coming in, there were tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of people lining the streets. But not only that, imagine three years of ministry, healing people, feeding the 5,000, probably 15,000, um, healing the sick, preaching to the, ser the Sermon on the Mount, all the rest of it. Tens of thousands of people. Okay. But then you go to the book of Acts, which is written about the period just after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in Luke, I'm sorry, in the book of Acts, <clears throat> it says this. The final group of people who were followers of Christ consisted of the 11 followers of Christ and about 110 men, women, and children. So of the tens and tens and tens of thousands, at the end, there were maybe 120 people left that followed Christ through thick and thin. My challenge to you is that amongst us here, that we'll be part of that small group of people right at the end, that no matter what, would follow. No matter what, through thick and thin, good and bad, whether the church is good for you or bad for you, whether you're going, a good, going through a good time or a bad time, whether you think Jesus has deserted you, whether you think that the church has deserted you, whether you think that God has deserted you, whether it feels like you've been walking through a dark valley for you don't know how long, whether God has answered your prayers or not answered your prayers, that somehow in the midst of your walk with Christ, you are connected with Christ and nothing ever will break it. That your faith and my faith will not depend just on whether things are going around, okay around us. But that we have such a deep connection with Jesus Christ. That just as we sang his praises on the Sunday, we would be at the foot of the cross on the Saturday and at the empty tune again next Sunday. No matter what. Let's pray. Gracious Father, you are a good God. We love you more than we could ever imagine. We are grateful, Lord God, for your love. 
and for your grace over our lives. Allow us, Lord God, to be part of the few. And allow us, Lord God, to make an impact for you and for Jesus' sake. In the name of Christ, we pray this prayer. Amen.